Hello and welcome to the 20th installment of my Pokemon Generation 3 ROM hacking series. The focus of this tutorial is to show off some scripting tips and to address some mistakes I've made throughout the past 6 tutorials. This video will be broken down into the following segments. What are some extra commands that I should know about? What are some helpful scripting strategies for making complex events? And what mistakes have you made that I should be aware of? There will not be an application demonstration after the bulk of this tutorial. This video is meant to serve as a wrap-up video to the past six tutorials, all dealing with scripting. The first couple of miscellaneous commands I want to discuss are the call and return commands. Throughout this series, we've used the go to command whenever we wanted to jump to another pointer section. Shown on screen is a script in which the player selects yes to receive a Bulbasaur, or no to receive a Charmander. The script uses the go to command to jump to either the at Bulbasaur pointer or the at Charmander pointer. If you take a look at these two separate pointer sections, the last three commands in both sections are the exact same. They both end in the same dialog being displayed, a release command, then an end command. Why waste extra lines of code if they're just hogging up space? Another way we can structure this script is by using the call command instead of go to. Go to simply jumps to another part of the script never to return. Call, on the other hand, jumps to another part of the script but is able to be returned at any time. The return command is used after giving the player the correct Pokemon. Return will return script execution back to its respective call command. This cuts down on the amount of code we have to write and makes things easier to read in my opinion. In my exchanging possessions video, I talked about how the give Pokemon command doesn't come with its own congratulatory message after it's used while the give item command does. If you don't want a congratulatory message to pop up after giving the player an item, you can use the add item command instead of give item. This command takes two parameters, those being the hex value of the item to give to the player and the amount, respectively. Another item command to cover is check item room. This command takes two parameters, those being the hex value of the item to check and the quantity, respectively. Check item room will check if the player has enough room in his or her bag to hold the specified amount of whatever item is being given. If so, last result will store the value 0x1. If not, it will store 0x0. The command check item takes two parameters, those being the item to check for and the amount, respectively. Check item decides if the player has at least a specified amount of whatever item. If so, last result will store the value 0x1. If not, it will store 0x0. The commands add PC item and check PC item function similarly to add item and check item. The only difference is that these commands add items or check if the player has at least a specified amount of items in his or her PC. Some hackers will use these commands at the start of their hacks to give the player some extra items to start off with. The last command I want to go over is check attack. This command checks if the player has at least one Pokemon in his or her party that knows the specified attack. If so, last result will store the value of the slot of the Pokemon that knows the attack, ranging from 0x0 to 0x5. If not, last result will store 0x6, since 0x0 is already being taken up by the possibility that the first Pokemon in the player's party knows the attack. I'll post all of the attack hex values in the description of this video. Let's move on to some helpful scripting strategies or implementation details for making more complicated events easier. The first trick I want to show off primarily focuses on lessening the amount of code you need to write and freeing up a huge amount of space in your ROM when inserting scripts. Let's say we have an event where the player is supposed to step onto one of three script events as shown on screen. From there, the player will be forced to walk and stand directly in front of the NPC for a more realistic looking interaction. Take a moment to think about how you might do this. At first glance, it might seem that we have to write three separate scripts that are all essentially the exact same, the only difference being the very beginning apply movement command that makes the player walk in front of the NPC. The left script event would have the player step up, step right, then look up. The middle would only have the player step up. The right would have the player step up, step left, then look up. All of the commands after that point would be the exact same, so why should we have to insert them separately and waste a bunch of space? There's actually a much quicker and cleaner way to merge the three script events into one. Let's start by writing the middle event script. So far we've written that apply movement command that's going to differ from other scripts. This one simply has the player step up one tile. 
This is where things are going to be a little bit different than what you might expect. Usually we would just finish off the script with some dialogue, then make the NPC disappear forever, as shown on screen. If we did it this way, we would have to write three scripts that all look like this, the only difference being a few pound raw commands under the movement section. We're actually going to split this script into two sections with the apply movement under the at start pointer and the rest of it under the at continue pointer. Everything under the at start pointer is unique to this specific event. Everything under the at continue pointer is going to be the exact same throughout all three events. Let's compile this. In the compiler output box, we've always just copied and pasted the at start offset. We're going to do that again here, but take notice that there's an offset given to us for the at continue pointer as well. You'll need to remember that offset for later. I've assigned this script to the middle event. Now we need to write the left event script. Shown on screen is the new script. As you can see, the apply movement values have changed a bit. You'll also notice that I completely removed the rest of the commands and replaced the at continue pointer with the offset 0x80001a. Remember that at continue offset the compiler output box gave us? We can actually jump directly to that already inserted code using a different script as long as we keep note of which pointer sections are stored at which offsets. We can compile this script and assign it to the left event. We'll do the same thing with the right event. Viewing the result, everything works out okay even though the majority of the script was only written and inserted a single time. This is an important implementation concept that I want you all to understand. It's a ton of help, especially when your scripts are starting to get really, really big. The next topic I want to cover is activating the national decks. The ordinary Pokedex can be activated with the simple set flag command, the values of which differ across the Gen 3 games and can be found in the description of my tutorial titled History Never Repeats Itself. If you're hacking Fire Red, using the command special 0x16f will activate it. This must be used sometime after the player has already been given the ordinary Pokedex or it won't work. Same for Emerald version, only you'll have to use the value 0x1f3 instead. If you're hacking Ruby, there is no special command for this. Type right byte to offset four times using the values shown on screen. This will properly activate the national decks. Let's move on to marking a Pokemon as seen in the player's Pokedex. The original games will sometimes do this with things like legendary Pokemon. For example, when Mesprit is found in Pokemon Platinum, a Pokepick of Mesprit pops up then it disappears, forcing the player to search the region for it. As soon as that Pokepick pops up, Mesprit is registered to the Pokedex without the player actually having to battle it. We can do this by storing the hex value of the Pokemon to register in the variable 0x8004. Next, type special 0x163, and the Pokemon will be registered to the player's Pokedex. Unfortunately, I couldn't find which special to use for Ruby or Emerald hackers, so if you know what that is, please let me know. My final tip is very important, I'd say even more so than knowing how to merge separate scripts using pointer offsets as demonstrated earlier. We're going to make an event in which an NPC walks out of a Pokemart door, walks up to the player, speaks, walks away, then disappears forever. This kind of a scenario is used all the time in hacks for things like rival encounters or other informational or significant events. The main reason why we're doing this is to cut down on the amount of flags used in a ROM hack. When you first learn about flags, it may seem like every single instance of a disappearing NPC must have its own unique flag. This is not true as long as you understand how to use this implementation trick. I've placed a script tile on the ground to trigger the event, which is what we're going to be assigning our script to. For this to work correctly, we need to place the NPC one tile above the door of the Pokemart. We also need to give him a movement type of hidden. Be careful though, there are three hidden movement types in the list. Choose the one closest to the bottom of the list or your game will reset whenever the NPC appears on the screen for whatever reason. This movement type will make it so that the NPC is not shown on the screen right away. The first order of business is to lock the player. At this point, the player will be standing right in front of the door of the Pokemart. Next, I'm going to make the player look up, then pause for a second. Now we need to make the NPC step out of the building. Remember that the NPC is currently hidden, but that doesn't mean we can't move him. 
He's currently one tile above the doorway, so let's move him down one tile. That's all we're going to do in this movement section. We need to open the door of the Pokemart so the NPC can properly walk out of it. Now that the door is opened, we can show the NPC's sprite to the player. At the same time, we're going to want the NPC to move down one more tile so that he's not standing in the doorway, and we want the player to move left one tile so that he's not in the NPC's way. I'm going to jam all of these movements together like so. Using the command pound raw 0x61 in the NPC's at m2 pointer section allows us to display his previously hidden sprite. At this point, the player and the NPC will be facing each other. We should close the door to the Pokemart, then write some dialogue. After that, we need the NPC to walk off screen and disappear, never to return. I've written the movements to get him to walk off the screen, but how can we make him disappear forever if he doesn't have a flag? To do this, use the pound raw value that simulates a hide sprite command. In my case, this would be 0x60. Be aware, however, that hide sprite only visually hides the sprite. In other words, if the player was to walk to the exact tile where the hidden NPC is standing, we would run into him and we would even be able to interact with him. In order to fix this, we need to move the NPC to a location where the player couldn't possibly interact with him, such as in the bordering trees. Finally, we can finish off the script and release the player. Viewing the result shows us exactly what we wanted to see. The NPC says his stuff, then walks out of reach, never to be seen again. You might be wondering what happens if we reload the map. The NPC will indeed be back to his original position, one tile above the door to the Pokemart, but this isn't a problem whatsoever. He'll always be hidden because of his movement type, and since the player warps into the building as soon as the warp event is tripped, there's no time for an interaction to take place. That's the reason we placed the NPC one tile above the door instead of directly on top of the door to begin with. Next up is a list of errors I've made in the past six tutorials or details I need to elaborate some more on. Cue the playback. The hexadecimal value that goes here corresponds to the Pokémon's national dex entry number. If a trainer has not yet been defeated, its trainer flag will be set. If we clear that trainer's flag, a battle is no longer possible. I'll start with the easier of the two, that being, the hexadecimal value that goes here corresponds to the Pokémon's national dex entry number. This isn't true. Some of the Pokémon hex values differ from their respective national dex positions. If you're writing scripts that involve Pokémon hex values and just recalling national dex positions off the top of your head, I suggest taking the safe route and referencing the list instead. There aren't many misplacements, but there are some, so better safe than sorry. Next is something kind of wonky. If a trainer has not yet been defeated, its trainer flag will be set. If we clear that trainer's flag, a battle is no longer possible. In that tutorial, I talked about how setting up trainer flag allows the player to challenge the trainer once again, and how clearing a trainer flag means that you can't battle the trainer anymore. This might have seemed suspicious to you at first if you're used to manipulating flags, and for good reason. It's counterintuitive. The reason I said this is because the set trainer flag command actually clears the specified trainer flag, while the clear trainer flag command actually sets the specified flag. XSE just flip-flopped the command names, I assume, on accident. So the correct way of thinking about it is that setting a trainer flag disables a trainer, and clearing the trainer flag enables the trainer. I just didn't want to confuse my audience right off the bat with both ways of thinking since they contrast each other. In summation though, if you want to disable a trainer, use the command clear trainer flag. If you want to enable a trainer, use the command set trainer flag. That's everything I wanted to cover in this tutorial. Hopefully you all learned something valuable from this, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask either over at Poke Community or right here in my video's comment section. Thank you so much for being my audience, and I'll be back in the 21st installment of this series.